Okay, well now we are beginning week five, and the subject this week is when should we practice civil disobedience? As we saw last week in uh, the sermon uh, in 1 Corinthians 3, uh, Paul told us that we have to choose whether we're going to be wise in the world's eyes or whether we're going to be wise in the eyes of God. Um, we're going to be f a fool to either God or to the world. And so Paul just says, make a choice. It's inevitable that you're going to be a fool to, to, to one party. Now, this question of disobedience, civil disobedience this morning, actually has the same flavor. Um, ultimately, it's not a question if we should disobey, given the right circumstances. But the question is, is who will we disobey? Throughout history, the people of God have been forced repeatedly into the position of either having to disobey the state or having to disobey God. So let's just quickly, the Exodus chapter 1 verse 16, the Hebrew midwives were given the order by Pharaoh to kill the little Hebrew male boys. They either had to disobey the state or God. In 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse 17, King Saul commanded his men to kill all the priests of the Lord at Nob. They either had to obey the state um, or they had to obey God. In Daniel chapter 3, verse 5, all the peoples, including Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were ordered to bow down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. They either had to disobey the state or disobey God. Daniel chapter 6, verse 9, King Darius signed an order that forbid everyone from praying for 30 days. Daniel either had to disobey the state or disobey God. In all of these cases, disobedience was required. It's impossible that both the state and God be obeyed. So it's not a question of if they should disobey the state, or, or if they should disobey, but who they should disobey. And so that's what we're looking at this morning in this morning's class is when should we disobey the state? When is obedience to the state disobedience to God? So our big idea is up on the board. We ought to carefully practice, and I, and I emphasize that, carefully, with care, we ought to carefully practice civil disobedience in order to preserve the unhindered worship of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what civil disobedience is ultimately going to be aimed at, is worship. And then we have uh, only two points this morning. The rule of civil disobedience for the church, and then the rule of civil disobedience for citizens. Now, under this first head, the rule of civil disobedience for the church, I broke up the two heads like I did because it's vital that we see the distinction between when and why we should disobey as citizens of a particular society versus when and why we should disobey as a church or as individual Christians. So let me draw a picture up here on the board and we're basically going to be using kind of for the rest of our time together same kind of Venn diagram that we've been seeing. And so the question above is when should we disobey? And there's, there's kind of three sections or three categories that we live in that we can answer that question. So the first one is when should we disobey as citizens? When should we disobey as the church? And then thirdly, I'll put down here, when should we disobey as individual 
think that those things are very, very easily confused. And let me just give you one example. I love John MacArthur. I go to his conference every year. I'm so thankful for his ministry. But he has historically confused these things together. In 2018, he was interviewed by Ben Shapiro on the Ben Shapiro show, and he argued against the Revolutionary War. Why? The answer he gave was because the church does not advance the kingdom through the sword. But that is a non sequitur in logic. The one doesn't follow from the other. Of course the church doesn't advance the kingdom through the sword, but what does that have to do with the colonies disobeying King George and starting a revolution? The colonies were not trying to advance the Christian religion, properly speaking, by revolting against King George, although that did happen, and it was a glorious effect of the Revolutionary War. But the Christians who fought in that war weren't firing bullets to convert people. Uh, they were firing bullets for freedom because King George had become a tyrant and he had usurped his role as a lawful king over the colonies. So that being said, let's just carefully talk about these different spheres when it comes to this doctrine of civil disobedience. So let's first begin by saying that God requires that we obey lawful Authority. He requires it. Romans 13, 1 through 2, Paul says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. <coughs> Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. So, the historical doctrine that the Anabaptists, for instance, have put forth is decidedly unbiblical. Um, this is what uh, James Bannerman says about them in his book, The Church of Christ. Quote, it was a fundamental principle in their creed, that's the Anabaptists, that the Church of Christ is vested in a civil supremacy over the rest of mankind and has a divine right to the inheritance of the earth as theirs with all of its temporal privileges and possessions. So the Anabaptists, at least many of them, believe that it, the state has no authority. It's the church that has ultimate authority. So historically, this has been played out in the Peasants' Revolt in Germany in 1525, where an upwards of 300,000 people perished. It was the Anabaptists who had instigated and even supported that revolt. Why? Because they believed that the secular state had no authority. But that's false. It wasn't man who created the state. It was God. And he gave it, he gave it as a gift to mankind to punish those who do evil and praise those who do right. 1 Peter 2.14. So to disobey the state out of hand is wicked. It's wrong. It's unrighteous. It's evil. Because it's to resist God. Now, having said that, the state doesn't have unlimited authority. In fact, Paul and Peter, whom we just quoted um, about obeying the state, were arrested for disobeying the state. Um, they were not arrested because they were uh, acting contrary to their own doctrines, but rather they were arrested um, because they were acting consistently with their own doctrines. The state, just like every other area of life, our parenting, our sex life, our money, our education, our vocation, our friendships, our private time, our sleeping, our eating, our drinking, all of it stands underneath the lordship of Jesus Christ. So we are not to obey the state no matter what, just like wives should not obey their husbands no matter what. Can you give me one example of when a wife should disobey her husband? Okay. Wives, you have to obey your husbands all the time from now on, no matter what they say. Decide. I just want to throw this out there. I don't know if this is correct, but... Um, is it going to answer my question? What do you... Say that again? What, when can wives <laughs> disobey their husbands? When they say to tell them not to go to church? 
Okay, Does good. That count? Nancy? When they, uh, when they ask something that the inspectors got some law. That's right. Very good. Nick? When your husband says he can't talk to church ever. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I can't wait to get to that section in print. <laughs> okay, um, so here's the rule, and, and Nancy hit it. When any office that's ordained by God, whether it's parent, policeman, pastor, politician, when they command something that is contrary to the Word of God, they have usurped their authority, and they are not to be obeyed. Now, this doesn't mean, so quick qualification. This doesn't necessarily mean that, that when that happens, they have completely vacated their office. But in the very least, it means that that particular command that has trespassed the law of God ought to be disobeyed. So if, if uh, a governor issues an unlawful order, we, we don't say, oh, you're out of here and we rebel. No, at the very least, we have to say that command must be disobeyed. Okay, so we don't, we're not jumping straight to revolt, okay? So, what does this look like in the sphere of the church? What does that look like here? Well, there are, very, there are three very clear things that Christ has given to the church that she is not allowed to surrender to the state. I wonder if I can fit them in. Can you guys see blue okay back in the back? Or should I go with a different color? So three things that the church can't surrender. The church can't surrender her doctrine. The church can't surrender her membership. And the church can't surrender her gathering. So, Christ has commanded the church what doctrine, number one? she should teach and which doctrine she should reject. Number two, Christ has commanded the church who she is to admit into her membership and who she's not. And then number three, Christ has commanded the church um, when she is to publicly gather for word and sacrament, namely every Lord's Day. And so Christ has placed these three things, the church's doctrine, membership, and gathering under the authority of the church. And both the scripture and the Westminster Confession of Faith call these things the keys of the kingdom. So Matthew 16, 19, Matthew 18, 17 through 18, John 20, 21 through 23, 2 Corinthians 6, 6 through 8, and then the Westminster Confession, chapter 30, paragraph 2. And this imagery of keys is actually extremely helpful. What do keys do? They open and they shut things. So Christ has given the church spiritual keys as it were, to unlock things and bring them into the light, or to shut things up and leave them in the darkness. So regarding our doctrine, the church uses the keys to bring those true doctrines to light for all to see. And she shuts out those heresies that destroy men's souls. Regarding our membership, the, key, the church uses the keys to admit those or to recognize those that belong to Christ's kingdom while she shuts those out who have no share in it. And then thirdly, the principal time which those keys are, ex are uh, exercised is every Lord's Day. Um, so therefore, whenever the state tries to um, seize any of those three things, either by dictating what doctrine we should or should not teach by dictating who or who we should not let into our membership or dictating when or if we're allowed to gather, the state is usurping its authority. And at least in those points, it ought to be disobeyed. Those powers don't belong to the state. Those are the things that Jesus, had, that God has rendered unto God, yeah. unto Caesar. So for instance, if the state ever told us that the church needs to teach universalism, that all people are to be saved, she has to disobey. So 
This is not um, crazy. In China, of course, the, the state churches are required to hang um, a picture of their supreme leader up on their walls and sing um, anthems to the Chinese government. They ought to disobey those commands. Those are, those are usurping their authority. Likewise, if the state ever commanded us to allow practicing homosexuals into our, or into our membership or practicing, I mean, name any, any sin that would disqualify them from membership, any sin where they're insisting and persisting in those things, practicing adulterers, we need to say, no, we're not going to do that. Or if the state ever told us we're not allowed to meet, any of those points would be the state usurping its authority. It'd be a bit like a man telling another man's wife to do his laundry or to raise his children. A husband doesn't have that authority, neither does the state. <laughs> the state's authority has clear limits. Okay, so then what about, what about this sphere? As individual Christians in society. Because an individual Christian, he doesn't have the same responsibilities as the, the, the church corporate. Now, I think it's a little bit more straightforward for the individual Christian, although it does raise some difficulties. So, again, the rule is this. Whenever the state commands a Christian to do something that is contrary to the Word of God, we are obligated to disobey it. So please turn with me to Acts chapter 4. Now, in Acts chapter 3, John and Peter healed a lame beggar, and the whole city ran to them to see what happened. And, and Peter and John began to preach about the Lord Jesus Christ, who only weeks earlier uh, the city had crucified. And this angered the rulers and the elders, so they had them arrested. Uh, on the next day, they bring Peter and John to ask by whose authority they were doing these things. And they respond in Acts chapter 10, uh, 4, verse 10. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. So they answer, this is the authority by which we're speaking these things. Jesus Christ. And they couldn't stand for this. So look at verses 16 through 18. The rulers asked themselves, What shall we do with these men? For a notable sign has been performed through them, is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may be spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more any, to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. So hopefully you see the dilemma right away, right? Jesus charged the apostles and by extension the church to go into the world, proclaim the gospel to all of creation. That's Mark 16, 15. But now the apostles are being told by the state to not preach the gospel. So what should they do? Look at verse 19. Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. So that was their answer. We must obey God rather than men. And the logic of the apostles is inescapable. They, they understood that it wasn't a matter of whether they would disobey or not. It was only a matter of who they would disobey. Disobedience is inevitable. And, and those are the two, I want to draw two principles from, from this sphere. This first one is that disobedience there are times when disobedience is inescapable. <clears throat> there are times when disobedience is inescapable. The only question is, is who will you disobey? When the state and Christ give contrary commands, one must be disobeyed. The second principle I want to derive is that disobedience 
is worship. Disobedience is worship. <clears throat> for the state to demand obedience contrary to the word of God is for the state to assume the role of God. And the first commandment is, you shall not have any other gods before me. So this issue of civil disobedience is of no small question. If we disobey God and obey the state, we're worshiping the state. If we disobey the state to obey God, we're <coughs> worshiping God. As Francis Schaeffer once said, the bottom line is that at a certain point, it is not only right, but it is a duty to disobey the state. That's in his book, A Christian Manifesto. But of course, there's some difficult questions that uh, arise when it comes to this issue of civil disobedience. And I, I don't want to pretend at all that the line is always clear like it was for Peter and John. It's just not. For instance, um, Romans 13.6 tells us that we are to pay taxes for the authorities are ministers of God. Taxes are, are, a, are a duty that God has given us in order to pay for our magistrates. So taxes are good. But what should we do when the government uses our tax dollars for abortion? After all, the sixth commandment says, you shall not murder. Abortion is murder. Are we accessories to murder if we pay our taxes? Or think of the progressive tax rates. When the government uses one tax rate for one group of people in the populace, and a different tax rate for a different group of people in the populace. That's unjust. Proverbs 20.10 says, Unequal weights and unequal measures are both alike an abomination to the Lord. So are we an abomination to the Lord if we participate in a tax code that does these things? Now I think both of those difficulties are actually fairly solvable. Remember what Jesus said. He was asked the question, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or no? Matthew chapter 22, verse 17. Now, the, part of the reason why that question was difficult is because they knew what Caesar did with this tax money. What, did, what were some of the things that Caesar did with taxes? Can you name one thing? Bill Walls. Bill Walls, okay. It's a good thing, Josiah. He murdered Christians. He murdered Christians. He crucified people unjustly, often. So, how does Jesus answer that question, knowing what's behind it? Well, he does say, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And in essence, he says, yes, pay your taxes. Um, of course, um, Caesar, what he did with that tax money was a mixed bag. Um, Nick said, yes, he, he built walls, he built roads, he paid government officials. Those were good things that Caesar was doing with that tax money. That's a right use. But of course, Caesar used the tax money also to crucify innocent people. Now, we have to conclude from Jesus giving the command that that blood guilt doesn't fall on the people who pay their taxes, but rather on Caesar who is misusing the taxes. It has to be this way. Otherwise, Jesus would be participating in sin. The logic is clear. So follow this four, four sentences. If Jesus commands us to pay taxes to the state, and the state uses some of that, those taxes for unrighteousness, and if we are accomplices in Caesar's unrighteousness because he used the taxes for evil purposes, then Jesus is commanding us to participate in unrighteousness. But Jesus can never command us to do something that is evil. So the principle is this. We are responsible for paying our taxes, and the state is responsible to God for using those taxes righteously. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't press the state to use the taxes in more righteous ways. Of course we should. The point here is that a Christian's conscience shouldn't be afflicted for paying taxes if the state uses those in wrong ways. So that covers 
sphere and this sphere, basically point number one. So let's go to point number two, the rule of civil disobedience for citizens. What about our duty as citizens? Is there ever a time for Christians as citizens to practice civil disobedience? And what I'm really driving at here is this. Is there ever a time to revolt against the government? Please turn with me to Romans 13. Is there ever a time to revolt against the government? So Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 3, says this. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. Now, let's just stop right there. If we put the period right there, it seems that there is no justifiable reason to ever revolt against the government. Because Paul says, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed and that's how many evangelicals um, interpret this text. We just have to do whatever the authorities say. Because whoever resists those authorities are resisting God. But we need to ask two important questions. Number one, and this first question is specifically for Americans. Who has the highest authority in our land? Who has the highest human authority in America. What is the highest law in America? The highest human law in America? People. What's that? People. The people. What did you say, Andy? Constitution. The Constitution. The Constitution has the highest authority in our land. So what happens when a lower magistrate, such as a mayor, a governor, or president, contradicts the Constitution in prescribing a law? Which authority should we obey? The Constitution or the said magistrate? The Constitution. We have an obligation to obey it as American citizens, which means unconstitutional laws given by whatever authority ought to be disobeyed. Ought to be disobeyed. Uh, Joby, you are still, both of you guys are in the military, right? I'm a veteran. You guys, have to make, you guys had to make oaths, right? Do you guys remember your oath? Can you say it? Uh, I just pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Okay, stop right there. That's perfect. Okay, <laughs> he has an obligation to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. So Joby didn't swear to defend unlawful magistrates against the Constitution, but the Constitution against unlawful magistrates. You see that we're right back to the same dilemma. Will, um, will our armed forces or our politicians or our magistrates, will they defend the, disobey the Constitution or will they disobey those who go against the Constitution? Will, what will we do when, when the magistrates contradict the Constitution? And this, doesn't, and this doesn't happen merely between magistrates and the Constitution. It also happens between magistrates themselves. In 2020, here in this COVID crisis, we have seen sheriffs in different states acting as lower magistrates, saying that they will not enforce the laws of their mayor or their governor, higher magistrates. So if you lived in one of those places, which magistrate's rules ought you to abide by? You can't abide by both. So again, it's not a question of if you will disobey, but who you will disobey. Now the second question, I have from Romans 13, applies more broadly than to just Americans. Here's the question. What constitutes legitimate authority? What constitutes legitimate authority? And he tells us here in the next verse, in Romans 13, in verse 3. He says, for, so don't resist 
um, those authorities God has appointed, because those who resist their incur, uh, those who resist will incur judgment. Four, verse three, rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. So let's write that up on the board. Rulers <coughs> are a terror. To the bad, not the good. Now, Peter is going to say essentially the same thing in 1 Peter 2.14 when he gives us the description of legitimate authority. So let me put that up there. What I'm describing here is legitimate authority. So principle number one from Paul is rulers are a terror not to the bad, but to the good. And then from Peter, Peter's going to say um, in 1 Peter 2, 14, that governors are sent by him, God, to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. So that's the second principle. Is it's, and it's essentially the same one, but I'm going to write it anyway. God sent rulers to... Punish evil and praise good. So here's the question. What happens when the state completely reverses that design? What happens when the ruler becomes a terror to the good? What happens when a ruler punishes those who do good and praises those who do evil? When that happens, that ruler is no longer a ruler. He is a tyrant. Francis Schaeffer says it like this, quote, God has ordained the state as a delegated authority. It is not autonomous. The state is to be an agent of justice, to restrain evil by punishing the wrongdoer and to protect the good in society. When it does the reverse, it has no proper authority. It is then a usurped authority, and as such, it becomes lawless and is tyranny. So the question then becomes, who should revolt? If, if the state usurps its authority by doing the opposite thing that God has designed, the question is, is who should revolt. And should, should it be other magistrates or the people themselves? And the reformers had two different answers to this question. Calvin and Luther believed that it was the duty of lower magistrates to take a stand against higher magistrates and remove them if necessary. So, sheriff taking out a mayor or whatever. Uh, the Scottish reformer, John Knox, believe differently. So Calvin's view, was, uh, Calvin and the Continental Reformers were lower magistrates. But John Knox, the Scottish Reformer, believed it was the people themselves. Again, Schaefer says it like this in his Christian Manifesto, quote, Whereas reformers such as Martin Luther and John Calvin had reserved the right to rebellion to civil rulers alone, John Knox went further. He maintained that the common people had the right and duty to disobedience and rebellion if state officials were contrary to the Bible. To do otherwise would be rebellion against God, end quote. So those are the two reformed views. Continental reformers believe that civil disobedience and revolt was left to the lower magistrates, whereas John Knox and the Presbyterians who followed them, love being a Presbyterian, believe that the, the common people had the right to revolt against their tyrannical government. Now, question. Which view had this country taken? This country? Yes. Yep. Four. Two. That's right. It's this view that justified the revolution in the 1800s. I mean, the colonies themselves didn't have access to lower magistrates. That was the very thing that they were being de denied. 
Remember, one of their grievances was taxation without representation. Now, historically speaking, it's fascinating to see that England called the, pre the, the Revolutionary War, they called it the Presbyterian War, because it was essentially on Presbyterian principles that justified the revolt. So let's take a stroll through the Declaration of Independence to see if we can get a sense of whether the Founding Fathers were taking their cues from Romans 13 to justify the war. So here's how it begins. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them together and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them. So let me pause right there. They believe that the laws of nature and nature's God entitled them to assume their own powers as an independent nation. And that necessarily implies that they were resisting the authorities that they were under. But our founding fathers were not anarchists. They realized that the burden of proof was on them to show how they were justified in resisting the authorities that they were under. So they continue. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Skipping ahead. Whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute a new government. Now notice, they believe that if a government stopped being a terror to the bad, but turned their sword against the good, it was the right of the people to revolt. And then they said this about the authority that they were under. Quote, The history of the present king of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove, to prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid vote. And then the, how the, the whole middle body of the, of the Declaration of Independence, they list 27 grievances uh, against the crown proving this tyranny. The first 12 grievances involve King George refusing to allow the colonies to form a representative government to make laws for the public good. How he continually interfered by dissolving colonial bodies of representation, replacing colonial governments with his appointed ministers, interfering with the naturalization of citizens in new regions. King George further interfered with judicial hearings, making, his, making judges dependent upon him for their jobs and salaries, which was essentially bribing judges. He kept standing armies in the colonies during times of peace, made the military power superior to the civil government, and required support through increased taxes. Those were the first 12 grievances. Grievances 12 through 22 describe the involvement of Parliament in England, destroying the colonists' colonist right to self-rule. The, the king passed laws without colonial input or consent. They forced the colonies to quarter troops. They shut off trade with other parts of the world. They levied taxes without the consent of colonial legislators. They took away the right of trial by jury, and they forced colonists to be tried in England. The last five grievances uh, refer to the specific actions that King George took in abandoning the colonies to wage war against them. The king further sent the British military to attack colonists, burn their towns, attack their ships at sea, destroy the lives of the people. He hired foreign mercenaries to fight against the colonies. He kidnapped American sailors to force them into British military service. He refused to protect the colonies from Native American attack and has caused colonists to fight against each other. 27 grievances. And this is what they said immediately following those grievances. Quote, in every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. And our repeated petitions have been answered by only repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free 
Now, they carefully reasoned, I believe, the way that John Knox reasoned. Romans 13 insists that we always be subject to the office of a magistrate. What is the office of a magistrate? What's the essence of it? Right here. Romans 13 does not require us, I do not believe, to be subject to the man in the office who commands that which is contrary to the Bible. So God willing, next week, we'll consider how we're to be citizens of both Christ and Caesar and what's at stake. And So, I think the difficulty with this, in my mind, is what's the ratio? What turns a ruler into a tyrant? Where's that line crossed? Because, as you mentioned with Jesus Christ, um, the Roman government what could have been, by many people, could have been described as tyrannical, right? Yep. Yep. So, but even in the face of that, Christ said, no, pay your taxes, obey, obey authority. Yep. So where's that? Yeah. And, and, that and that's precisely where the difficulty is, brother. Um, and, and there's even more considerations than just that. So for, for those who are watching, the question was, is where is the line? What turns the tide, so to speak? Um, I mean, think about our brothers and sisters who are in North Korea or China. Um, they, right now, wouldn't have a prayer to try to revolt against their governments. They would be squashed and destroyed. So there is a count-the-cost principle as well at play. And... Um, for, and we just look back historically. Apparently, the founding fathers had both the the right in their mind to, to revolt and the ability to do so. Um, so, again, what I've said at the beginning of this class is I'm kind of laying out general principles. I, I, I would dare never say, well, right here is where we draw the line. Um, does that help or not? Yeah. I know it's I know I didn't answer your question, but I, I don't have that much wisdom. I don't got it, Nick. So you address um, the conscience of people when you see that he said this here. Is that a question? The Christian conscience when paying taxes yep. the state. Yep. Can you articulate anything in scripture about the same principle when they buy something from a private company? Because a lot of Christians avoid travel and say Starbucks or something. They take that money and turn it to support causes that are antithetical. Yeah. Is there anything in scripture that deals with that? Uh, general principle. Um, so, I don't know if this would be helpful. I'll talk to you after class about that. I, I, unless somebody else has anything that they would want to joke. Oh, I think it's the, the concept of Christian liberty in that. Especially in a capitalist society, we in some sense vote with our pocketbook. And so if it is your conviction not to support the neighborhood business because of its practices, then don't do it. But if somebody does support that business through their commerce, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's in your sort of way. If somebody wants to boycott Starbucks because of their behavior, is right to do so, that's their, their conviction. But that doesn't mean that everybody should also boycott Starbucks. Yeah, I think you'd have to prove. If somebody were to put it on everybody else's conscience as well, they'd have to prove un unequivocally how it's immoral to give money to any corporation that does, you know, said things or whatever else, X, Y, and Z. Yeah, that's what I was getting at. If Christ absolves the Christian for paying taxes, does he absolve the consumer? In some ways. So let's say you were a medical uh, equipment producer, okay? Um, and you create medical equipment all the time. You, you create scalpels, right? Um, scalpels um, do a lot of good. They cut out tumors. But sometimes they also do evil things like cutting out babies. Um, creating a scalpel is a good thing because it does good things. The person who does evil things with it, the evil is attributed to them. But if a medical um, <coughs> producer, if, if a certain let's say an invention was created that was only used to kill babies, there was no other use for it, then it would be wrong for the Christian to 
be involved in the production of that equipment or purchase it or anything else. So the Planned Parenthood's business is only 10% of what they do then? Because that's what they've seen. They say, hey, we don't just do that. We only do that. But my question is more to the consumer, not, not manufacturer. If I'm a manufacturer of a product, yeah, I, I get that. But I'm just wondering, if, if I buy a product from Target and Target says, hey, we're dealing with all this transgender stuff. Yeah. Does the scriptures dissolve the Christian from going in there buying a format? I don't support that company. I don't think so. I think the same principle applies. Uh, just taxes. Just taxes. Yeah. Just taxes. Okay. Libby. Yeah. Um, okay, so my question was it seems like you're, um, when you referred to taxes paying for abortions, it was some of it, it was my parenthood. And like he said, you know, they do abortions. No one's not going to say that. But they also do a lot more with the like, reproductive health and women's health. So I was wondering if we had the same stance or other. Other companies, or not just other companies, but other organizations that do a lot of variety of things but still take life from the military. So, I, I don't know if I follow. I don't want to. I don't want to misanswer you. I think you can reword your question again. Um, so, if you're talking about taxes, you advocated to um, influence politicians to make more just choices. And like what I took from that is taking advantage of abortion stance and not on the right. Do you see on the same military, which also takes place? So um, that's a great question. Um, there is a difference between murder and killing. Um, and the Bible makes this very, very clear. Murder is the unjustified taking of someone's life. Killing sometimes is righteous. Um, I'm going to give you an example. The Bible says in Genesis 9 that when someone sheds man's blood, his blood will be shed. So it's laying down the principle of capital punishment in under right circumstances. Um, the, the same type of principle applies to war. Now, all wars are not just. Soldiers do murder people sometimes. But not everything that a soldier does... Is, is unjust. In fact, they're, they're, they're supposed to exist for righteousness. I mean, police, when police are in the line of duty, they're getting paid by tax dollars, and if they have to take someone's life because that person is uh, threatening the lives of other people, that's a righteous act. If someone breaks into my home at night and um, my family's being threatened, if I kill them, it's not murder. So there's an important distinction between murder and killing. Can I add something to that? Sure. The, there are things that we have to do that we wouldn't have to do in a perfect world. I mean, as it is, even as Christians, like, why do we have locks on our doors? Or why do we have weapons to begin with? So I think there are, even as Christians, because we live in a fallen world, it would justify doing certain things, just not all of them. Um, which is why we know that self-defense and, you know, being on the just side of a war is just and not immoral for a Christian to do those things. There are unjust wars, but not all wars are unjust. worship issue. We ask these things in Jesus' name.